Welcome to Web Kick Radio. I'm Riley Pollock, your host for this very special CFL playoff preview episode. Today I will be previewing each playoff matchup all the way to the Grey Cup and predicting a winner from each game plus a bunch of other CFL stuff with this week's special guest, Addison Richards. Addison has done it all in terms of football. He played receiver for the University of Regina before being drafted by the Bombers. He played there for two seasons. He also coaches our former high school, Sheldon Williams Collegiate, and their season just wrapped up. Addison, uh, how are you doing today? Doing well, man. It's great to be uh, back here on the, on the podcast. Uh, yeah, like you said, I was back at... Back at the old stomping grounds again at Sheldon for uh, for my third season as the receiver coach. Uh, we were bumped up to the big school division again and uh, had some early struggles, but showed that we can still hold our own with the with the big guys and uh, just lost out in the playoffs to the eventual uh, Regina City champs, uh, the Boldest Golden Suns. Uh, so yeah, that season is is done now and um, just getting geared up here for uh, select football, which is club football here in. Uh, Southern Saskatchewan, so that'll take uh, take up some of my time here in the in the coming months and working away at school and yeah, just keeping busy. Yeah, uh, how's school going for you? you Got to be getting close to final season here. Yeah, it's uh, it's getting down to it. Yeah, some classes are going better than others, but uh, <laughs> I'll have one more semester after this, and then I'll be uh, I'll be finally done the degree. So that's something to look forward to, a little motivation to keep in the books. Nice. Well, congratulations. I'm sure that you'll crush your last semester in a bit here. If I do recall, you were definitely the smarter one out of the two of us all through school, so uh, I have no doubts in my mind about that. You're far too kind. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's uh, let's dive right into this thing. we got a lot to cover here. Um, let's start with how you thought the season went. What, what do you think was kind of the biggest surprise from the CFL season and... Uh, yeah, just kind of your general takeaway from the regular season. For sure, because uh, yeah, we, we we did a preview show too. Yeah, and I think if we looked, I think if we looked back at that, uh, I think I think your predictions were a little more on target uh, than mine. But uh, yeah, starting I, in the east, starting in the east, I think we still we still thought Montreal was going to be a struggling team, and obviously they had uh, quite a turnaround under Kahari Jones and uh, ended up being a playoff team. Uh, Toronto certainly struggled. Ottawa uh, had the hot start. I mean, they came out two and zero with quarterback Dom Davis under center, and then kind of from there on out, it was uh, obviously a struggle, leading to uh, just recently their uh, head coach Rick Campbell stepping away, mutually kind of parting ways with the team. Uh, and then obviously Hamilton, I think we both predicted as kind of being the class of the East, and they yeah. certainly uh, did that. And then some. Was it uh, was it not their best? Was it their best record in? franchise history yeah i think they beat it by like two wins or something i think 13 was the most that they had before and even after losing their uh pretty much mop candidate quarterback uh jeremiah mazzoli uh dane evans came in and uh, after a couple couple of shaky games he really started to uh to light things up on offense so uh yeah that was yeah i guess that's the east rundown but out in the west uh you know it looked like it was going to be winnipeg's uh, division for the taking uh, until uh, the Matt Nichols injury and uh, obviously Strebler went in and uh, was kind of on some games, off some games, but I think defenses uh, were you know, kind of figuring him out week by week and, and how the game plan was going to be for, for using him uh, so they you know, were still able to lock up a uh, playoff spot, uh, which is you know, that's all you can really hope for Calgary, obviously, uh, without Bo Levi for a few weeks, uh, Nick Arbuckle was able to come in and, and do some good things and keep them keep them competitive. And you know, Calgary's Calgary; they're always going to be uh, tough at this time of year, especially uh, Saskatchewan. I think is still the biggest biggest surprise for uh, a team doing well. Obviously, losing Zach Claros within a few plays of the season starting, uh, turning to uh, an unproven starter in Cody Fajardo and everybody kind of knows how that shook down he ends up being uh kind of labeled as the savior here in, in Saskatchewan <laughs> and, and rightfully so he's, he's he hasn't made 
you know, the big mistakes. He hasn't, uh, it hasn't seemed like the, any moment has been too big for him. And uh, it's a guy that, you know, regardless of what team you're faithful to, uh, he, he's a guy that you kind of root for. Uh, BC, after all of their free agent moves and coaching moves and everything, uh, you know, they really seemed like they were gearing up for a, for a big season and they were obviously one of the biggest uh, disappointments. Uh, Mike Riley took an absolute beating and uh, surprisingly though was the last starting quarterback to finally uh, kind of shut it down for the season health-wise. Uh, so that was surprising and then Edmonton was kind of middle of the pack. Like they sometimes looked like quite a good team under Trevor Harris who uh, missed some games due to injury. Uh, I think I just I looked at their schedule and three or four uh, losses were were probably within that three to seven point range. So kind of just a case of maybe not being able to make the big the big plays when they had to. Uh, but with him back for the playoffs uh, and his his obvious postseason experience uh, in, in championship games as well, I think that'll bode well for them. But it was a crazy league. I mean, this, <laughs> it was awesome to, yeah. uh, to follow again. And uh, obviously this first round of playoffs is always super exciting. Uh so yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this weekend. Yeah, it's it was an absolutely crazy week or season. Like you never really knew there was those bottom three teams, but BC seemed to always be in games. Toronto got better when pinball came around. It seemed like they were just a little bit more competitive, and then I mean Ottawa beat Calgary at the start of the season and then just fell right off. So besides those three bottom teams, like anyone could beat anyone every single week out of those top six. So it was a fun season to watch and uh i'm assuming that the playoffs are going to be just as good um we have a little bit of breaking news this morning addison um the lions relieved head coach devon claybrooks of his duties this morning after just one season how do do you feel about that move uh i was pretty surprised and uh yeah i got the breaking news uh from you so that was pretty cool uh, it's it's kind of tough. I mean, you give a guy one season with a lot of new pieces, uh, and you know, I feel like for any sort of rebuild or turnaround, you need you need kind of that two to three seasons to really see if it's going to turn out. Uh, you know, maybe there's things behind closed doors that we're not aware of, and uh, you know, it's hard to speak on that. But sometimes, sometimes these these coordinators. Uh, they are they're great at you know being coordinators and not having to kind of take on uh, the leadership role for an entire team. Uh, obviously, Coach Clay Brooks was extremely successful uh, within the Stamps organization uh, as the DC, uh, and certainly earned the opportunity to be a head coach. And that's not to say that he won't uh, get another opportunity with uh, some possible vacancies opening up in this coming off season. Uh, but yeah, some guys are really just suited to being that coordinator role, handling uh, either the offense or defense, uh, and that's that's kind of just where they they fit within the the coaching hierarchy. So, um, but still, I think I, I think that you have to give it at least a season, probably two seasons, even maybe in three seasons, to see if uh, this is going to be your guy or not. But you know, maybe uh, Ed Herbie just knew this wasn't going to work out and, and made a move and made a decision. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see who kind of slides into that head coaching spot. Yeah, I, I'm i not sure that I fully agree with it. I thought Devon Claybrooks did a good job of keeping the locker room, even with a tough season. It seemed like BC was always competitive. There was never anyone giving up. And he managed to keep Deron Carter on the same roster for an entire season. So that's got to be a victory in itself. <laughs> you're absolutely right, yeah. Uh, and you're right, they they weren't... They weren't really. They they were a very competitive team, like you said. They were in games, and uh, there was even a point near the end of the year where they were kind of stringing some games together, and uh, they still weren't mathematically eliminated from the playoffs. So they still had something to play for. Uh, and usually, with if you're able to finish your season on a high note or on some sort of you know win streak or positive uh, positive note, positive vibe, uh, players are able to ride that into the off season and into the into the next season, and then you're kind of you're not starting. From ground zero with new staff new players uh everybody's one 
everybody's on the same page and just ready to uh, hit the ground running and uh, get the season started on a high note. So uh, I agree with you there. Probably a little quick on the trigger with the uh, with the move. Yeah, so we'll see. I mean, Rick Campbell is out there, like you mentioned, and I think if Edmonton doesn't do well, Moss is gone, and that's probably his number one destination to hook back up with Trevor Harris. But uh, we'll see because, honestly, the coaching carousel might be the most interesting part of free agency this year. It definitely might be. Uh, all, uh, like you mentioned, uh, Rick Campbell's out. He'll be certainly a sought-after uh, coach there for one of the spots. Uh, there's been rumblings in Winnipeg about Michael Shea's future. I know uh, in a few recent interviews he says he wants to come back, uh, but he's been linked to uh, some either a, a coordinator role or a spot with the Argonauts potentially. Uh, so I think, yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it might be the first time in a while where, uh, where we're watching the coaching moves more so than the player moves uh, for the upcoming off season. Well, there's no way that it, the free agent frenzy can be as crazy as it was last year. They got oh, to have goodness. signed some of those people for more than one year. Yeah, uh, that, was, uh, that was wild. Last yeah. Year. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, before we dive into the playoff matchups, just got one question for you. Who do you think the MOP is this season in the CFL? Oh, that's, a, that's a tough question. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's so many good candidates out there, and uh, some that obviously are not up for the award for, uh, for different reasons. <laughs> uh, Geez, I just have to refresh my memory on uh, the uh, the nominees here. You got uh, Big Play VA in Montreal. Okay, uh, right. Brandon Banks in Hamilton has had an insane season. Um, I believe Darrell Walker was the Toronto representative. I don't even know who Ottawa's was. Um, Cody Fajardo. Reggie Bagleton, I believe Brian Burnham was the BC representative, Trevor right. Harris in Edmonton, and Willie Jefferson, I believe, was the was the Winnipeg one. Well, looking at that list, wow, that's a tough list. I mean, obviously, uh, I think you're probably going to go with a guy that's on a more competitive roster, so... Uh, out uh, west, you know, I think it's you're probably looking at between Fajardo and Bagleton. I mean, Fajardo obviously for coming on the scene as a quarterback and with really no expectations, and then putting up the numbers and leading his team the way that he did. Uh, and then Reggie Bagleton from Calgary, obviously just coming in and really ripping the entire league up. Yeah, the guy's uh, a monster. Having, having multiple uh, multi-touchdown games. Uh, so it would be tough between those two out west. Uh, and then in the east, obviously Brandon Banks, another strong season. Uh, always, you know, undersized guy, but fast guy. and just seems to make plays uh, no matter who's covering him. Uh, so it would be tough to be against him, but I think uh, a guy like Vernon Adams would have a chance. Uh, maybe not the same uh dominance on the stat sheet, but his uh, impact and uh, his play and his leadership in turning around that Alouette's team uh, was pretty impressive. So uh, between those four, East and West, I think you're probably going to see one of the outright winners come from that group. Yeah, I've I've thought that Fajardo versus Banks would be the final matchup that we see at awards night. And Like, I think this might be the year that a receiver picks it up. I mean, Brandon Banks cost the most money on fantasy football every week and would still get you 40 points and almost seemed worth it every week. I mean, the guy is a human highlight reel. Dana Evans really found a good connection with him. And as good as Fajardo played, I just think, like, man, Brandon Banks was unreal this year. Yeah, what he means to that team and to that uh, that offense... Uh, and even his, his special teams contributions uh, in the return game are are really quite valuable. So, yeah, I think you can put a pretty good argument for uh, Banks taking it home. 
All right, it's uh, it's time to get down to the nitty gritty here, Addison. We are going to pick a winner from every matchup all the way to the Grey Cup here. Are you ready? I'm ready for this. Been, all right, been ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with the East semi. Edmonton crosses over and takes on Montreal this Sunday. Um, Montreal looking like they're selling tickets pretty good for it, and. It's just the league's a better place when the Alouettes are relevant. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, you need uh, you need those teams out east uh, to be successful. I mean, you're always going to get uh, pretty solid numbers uh, with the Western teams, Saskatchewan, uh, Winnipeg. Uh, but out east, I mean, it's been a struggle, obviously, uh the, the trouble that Toronto's had in recent years. So to have a to have a healthy, competitive Montreal has been really big this season. Yeah, Edmonton looked pretty good to start the first third of the season. Trevor Harris was really whipping the ball around. That offense was moving. The defense had really good numbers. And then he kind of got hurt, and he played through a couple games, but just the offense didn't look like themselves. And then he sat out. And this team really hasn't done much on offense since then their defense still top of the league statistically but uh why do you think they weren't able to finish higher in the standings this year with such a dominant defense and what looked like a good offense it's tough to put my finger on it i mean uh yeah they look like they would challenge uh for one of the top spots in the west early on in the season uh it's it's tough to to tell how how beat up trevor was in, in certain games and whether that uh hurting his performance. I mean, he was still putting up crazy numbers, uh, but it just seemed like they just lacked that that sort of killer instinct that we need that that big play uh, at the key moments, and that's what kind of led to three or four games not really swinging their way and uh, kind of dropping out of that that upper echelon of Western teams. But I think heading into the playoffs, kind of like we or I touched on earlier, uh, Trevor has extensive playoff experience, extensive championship experience. He has. Uh, you know, supporting cast on offense, uh, Greg Ellingson that's been along for the ride with them, uh, CJ Gable, who I know has been a little beat up, uh, and I'm not sure what his uh, status is heading into this game, but a thousand yard rusher, a guy that you can lean on uh, in the run game, uh, and going up against the Montreal uh, defense that's dead last and getting after the quarterback, I think they have uh, less than half the amount of sacks that the Edmonton defense was able to generate. So if Trevor's able to sit back there uh, without much pressure and sort of just nickel and dime and take his shots when he sees them, uh, it should bode well for that Edmonton offense. Yeah, and I believe their O-line gave up the least sacks as well this year, so that seems to be in favor. That battle, uh, Montreal's D-line versus Edmonton's O-line, seems to be largely in favor on the Edmonton side. Um Montreal, a bright spot this year. We mentioned it earlier. Um, what do you think was the key to turning their, to turning this team around so fast? Uh, I think you have to give a ton of credit, uh, obviously, to the interim head coach, Kahari Jones. Uh, really put in a tough spot at the start of the year, like any uh, sudden job promotion, especially in professional football, where he was all of a sudden the guy. Uh, but kind of similar to uh, how the Riders have responded with uh, their new head coach Peg Dickinson. The team seems to have taken on sort of the identity of their head coach. Uh, you know, you see him out uh, on TSN there, they have clips of him. He's out there dancing to his music and he's he's throwing passes in pregame and uh, even before the opening kickoff the camera will go to him and he's he's fired up, he's bouncing around just like he uh, is, is, a, is a player getting ready to go into battle and uh, I think the team really feeds off of that and I think that his work uh, obviously as a former quarterback working with Vernon Adams Jr. who is tremendously talented uh, but is not going to be a guy that's going to throw 30 passes a game he's going to be in that you know 20 20 25 attempts a game he's going to have his chance uh, to run the ball Uh, so I think Kahari letting Vernon Adams played his strengths and not having to do too much and letting him uh, use his legs, uh, which is obviously one of his strengths, has certainly helped this team. And, uh, yeah, they were really exciting to watch, and I think it's going to be uh, a pretty good game because they're, 
they just seem to be they just were a team that got better every week. Uh, so it'll be it'll be exciting to see them in the playoffs. All right, and I think it's time for your prediction. Who do you think wins the East semifinal between Edmonton and Montreal? Uh, I'm going to take Montreal. Uh, obviously, it's always been a struggle for that crossover team. You very uh, rarely have seen uh, that Western team come in uh, and beat the, the Eastern opponent. Uh, I think Montreal is just playing uh, very, very consistent football. Their defense, obviously not uh, one of the top ones in the league, uh, but they have done enough to uh, get the stops when they need and let that offense sort of control the game, control the clock uh, with their outstanding rushing attack. Obviously, William Stanback, too, in the backfield, burst onto the scene and has done some really uh, good things for the team. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the Alouettes. All right, there you have it. I agree with you, Addy. So we will both take Montreal in the East semifinal. Now let's slide over to the West, where this could be an absolute bloodbath. Um, Winnipeg hit a bit of a rough patch when Matt Nichols went down. Like you mentioned, Chris Dreveler had good games. He had some bad games. Teams were able to game plan for him. But now Zach Caleros has come over from Toronto at the trade deadline. He picked up a win as a starter against Calgary that stopped them from being first in the West. He looked pretty good. Uh, I think all signs point to him starting against Calgary on Sunday. Do you agree? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, he's going to he's gonna start that game. And uh, really excited to see what they've been able to put together uh, with two weeks of preparation. Uh, they had a, a bye week for the final week of the regular season. Uh, so I feel like that just gives uh, additional time for Caleros and offensive coordinator Paul Apolis to uh, to sit down and really uh, hammer out a solid game plan and then get Caleros just a little more up to speed uh, in terms of what's expected in the offense. Uh, Lapo's known as a guy that uh, keeps things simple, uh, simple but obviously effective, so... Another week of prep for those guys is going to be huge, but I do hope that they uh, keep Strebler involved. Uh, if he is healthy, he obviously took quite a beating the last time uh, the two teams met at McMahon Stadium, uh, having you know a hard time walking, walking off the field. Walking, yeah. <laughs> like he, 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 he took an absolute beating, and it was it was kind of uh, tough to see. He's a really tough, tough kid, tough player, obviously. But if he's healthy and ready to go. Uh, I think that there's going to be a spot for both of them to play, but Claros will get the start. All right, and Calgary been pretty consistent all season long. When Bo returned from his injury, it seems like the team flipped a switch, only losing that one game, really, to uh, Winnipeg at the end of the season. Uh, they couldn't finish off their quest for first, but I'm assuming it's going to make them even more hungry. Uh the question for me is their run game. I'm not a huge fan of Calgary's run game. Do you think that they're going to be able to patch together some sort of run game, say if it's snowing and minus 20 in a game this weekend, which it very well might be, uh, do you think they have the run game to be able to pull off a Grey Cup run and uh, make it to the Grey Cup at home? It's, it's going to be tough. I mean, throughout the entire uh, season for any team, you kind of establish your identity and what your what your strength is going to be and what you're kind of going to f- fall behind uh, each week. Uh, and Calgary's coming into this game, they were dead last in yards per game uh, in rushing, and you're going up against a Winnipeg defense that's first against the rush. So uh, it's, it's obviously going to be tough sledding. I've really liked what I've seen from uh, Milanovic leader, the, uh, the Canadian tailback, and it kind of seems like with the way that the weather's going to be, it's going to be cold, uh, and he's a bigger kind of bruising back. Uh, and I think if they're going to attempt to run the ball, I think they're going to have to get behind a guy like that and really churn out uh, some of those tough, uh, those tough, tough yards running into the teeth of that Winnipeg defense. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to—it's obviously going to come back into the hands uh, of Bo Levi, who uh, has been mixed. Vic- very, very efficient uh, since his return. Uh, hasn't seemed to take the same amount of uh, maybe risks or kind of that gunslinger mentality. 
he's been really sort of picking apart teams, making the smart throws, and uh, has just looked really, really solid. Uh, so they may try to run the ball a little more, but at the end of the day, it's going to be in Bo's hands when the game's on the line. All right. You've got uh, the breakdown from Addison Richards on the West semifinal. Addy, who is advancing to Saskatchewan to take on the Rough Riders in the West final? You know what? I see this one as like an absolute toss-up. Uh, these teams kind of, uh, they always seem to match up well. Uh, I'm going to take, uh, with a little bit of bias, having been a former player, but obviously uh, I think I think the Caleros bring something different to this team. And uh, if their game plan is to not make him do too much and just make the throws that he's comfortable making, uh, and it's always a pretty good option to turn around and hand the ball off to Andrew Harris, the top rusher, obviously in the in the CFL this season. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Winnipeg and the upset uh, going into McMahon. There, uh, I think it'll be an extremely close game. Like you said, I think it's gonna be hard hitting. It's gonna be cold. It's gonna be a great Western uh, showdown. But I'm gonna go with Winnipeg. All right, I'm going to have to disagree with you on that one, but uh, <laughs> well, I just in I just Calgary has a thing about winning at home, and uh, I think they'll do it again this weekend. But I I think it could be like a walk off field goal type of game. Um, all right, there you have it. Addison's picks for the East and West semifinals are Montreal and Winnipeg. I'm going to take Montreal and Calgary. As we move along to the East Final, which will be in our case, Montreal at Hamilton. And Hamilton's been unreal all season long. Like you mentioned, Masoli went down. Dane Evans took a couple games to look comfortable, but has really butted into a star in the league over the back half. The whole team has been amazing, and they'll be very difficult to knock out this year. Uh, Do you see any weak spot in this Hamilton roster? I really, I really don't. I mean, you look at their offense, they're number one in scoring, number one in overall yards, number one in passing, and even have a fourth-ranked rushing attack. Uh, they, are, they are solid from top to bottom. Uh, like you mentioned, Dane Evans has really settled into uh, that starting role nicely, being forced into, into duty with the injury to Mazzoli, like you mentioned. Uh, but he's got a star-studded cast to, uh, to throw the ball to. Brandon Banks, Braylon Addison had a strong season. Uh, and then defensively uh, anchored by Simone Lawrence, whether you like him or hate him. Uh, if he's on, you'd rather him be on your team than having to play against him. Uh, so they are a very solid, solid football team uh, in all three phases, uh, and obviously why that they were uh, the top team in the league overall this year. And how do you feel Montreal matches up against this Hamilton team? Uh, you know what, I think, I feel like, the Montreal defense might get a little bit exposed uh, in this game. Um, let me just check uh, check my notes here. Uh, they're the worst pass defense in the CFL, uh, going up against an absolute passing juggernaut uh, with the Tie Cats. Uh, so I think it could be a long day for that defense. And uh, having a few extra weeks to game plan for. Uh, Vernon Adams Jr. and that Montreal running attack uh, will obviously bode well for the for the Hamilton uh, the Hamilton fans. So uh, I think it'll be tough for them to go into uh, the donut box and come up with a win. All right, so I'm going to ask you anyway. Who do you <laughs> think is going to be the East representative? I think I know the answer. Yeah, not hard to read between the lines there. I think uh, Hamilton will be the East rep and, uh, you know, continue on this uh, incredible season that they have. All right, yeah, I can't disagree with you there. I mean, Hamilton has shown me no reason not to pick them to go to the 107th Grey Cup in Calgary. So uh, me and you have the same East bracket. Let's uh, <laughs> let's see how different the West bracket's going to be as we head to the West final. We'll go with yours. Winnipeg at Saskatchewan is what you have decided. Um, the Riders won their first West Division title since 09. They played really well thanks to their defense and uh, a little sprinkle of Jesus, as they're saying, in Saskatchewan in the co- in the form of Cody Fajardo. 
He's kind of been a light in what most Ryder fans thought was going to be a dark season after Caleros went down on the third play of the season. Did you expect this from this Riders team this season, or even to make the playoffs at all after Caleros went down? Definitely not. I didn't even have them pegged as a playoff team. Uh, they've certainly surprised me. Uh, I look at uh, some of their other surprises on offense. Obviously, the addition of William Powell has been huge uh, to help that run game. Their offensive line has been, has been quite solid all season. Uh, Shaq Evans has been dominant, has been you know, blossomed into one of the, the better receivers in the entire league. Uh, and then you look on defense, they're able to, to get up, to get after the quarterback quite well, obviously with Charles Hughes back there, uh, who's just a monster. You can, you can double him, you can game plan for him, but he still seems to get to the quarterback. And uh, Nick Marshall, again, in the defensive backfield has been pretty solid. Uh, so, you know, I didn't, I didn't expect this from them, uh, but they, they, again, they've, they've really, shown that they've they've come together. Uh, Craig Dickinson has done a great job leading the way for them. And, uh, yeah, playoff football at uh, the new Mosaic Stadium should be uh, pretty crazy. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm coming home for that one. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. I may have to drive up Sunday morning and leave Monday morning, but I will not miss that game. I will be there. <laughs> and... Uh, it's it's going to be exciting whether they play Calgary or Winnipeg. Those are two great rivalries, and uh, you know Mosaic Stadium is going to bring it. I'm sure there's still a few seats available, but last I looked on the seat map, it was a lot of the nosebleeds, few in the Pill Country area. But uh, it's it's going to be loud in Saskatchewan because they haven't had a West Final since '09, and uh, I all I think we all remember how that Grey Cup ended in Calgary. So uh, hopefully. The Riders can get back to the Grey Cup, but uh, the ending is a little bit different. All right. Who do you have to win this game between Winnipeg and Saskatchewan? Uh, you know what? It's going to be It's tough to, to bet against Saskatchewan uh, with the season they've had, and I think I am going to take Saskatchewan. Uh, the only thing that I could see... Uh, Kind of coming in, kind of being a storyline. Uh, obviously, this is this is Cody's first uh, playoff start, uh, and you know, regardless of how the regular season goes, the playoffs are just different. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how he handles it, uh, and not only him, the entire team. I mean, the pressure, the pressure to win that game in this city, like you can probably uh, understand, is going to be off the charts. Uh, you know, for a, for a team, whether it is Winnipeg or Calgary, to come in here and uh, and pull off a win would uh, obviously leave the the hometown crowd uh, speechless and, and pretty pretty upset, pretty angry. So, uh, if the Riders are able to kind of handle uh, the outside noise leading into that game, which I feel like uh, you know the way that that Craig, Coach Craig Dickinson has done things all season, I feel like it it shouldn't be an issue, but if uh, they do start kind of feeling the pressure, and uh, if they were to get behind a little bit early, one or two scores in that game, uh, I think the wheels might come off. But I'm going to take Saskatchewan despite despite all of that, uh, because they are they are very solid uh, offense, defense, special teams, and uh, yeah, they're going to be my West my West rep. All right, yeah, I got you there. Hamilton and Sask were my two picks as well, so we took different routes through the West, but got to the same result. Um, all right, that means that Hamilton and Saskatchewan, in our eyes, will face off at the Grey Cup, November 24th, 6 p.m. Eastern in Calgary. Um, hopefully it's a nice day. I'm sure I will be there whether the riders are in it or not. Hopefully getting some media accreditation. Um, <laughs> Hamilton and Saskatchewan played each other twice this season. Hamilton won 23-17 in the first matchup. That's the game that Simone Lawrence knocked Zach Caleros out of the game and basically off the Saskatchewan Rough Riders roster because Fajardo came in and had a great season. They met again in August, and the Riders took down the Tiger Cats 24-19. So two close games, both teams winning at home. One and one. Um, how do you see these two teams matching up in the Grey Cup, Addy? 
Uh, you know, yeah, based on what you said there, going back to their regular season meetings, two close games, so it's kind of a dream uh, matchup having two uh, pretty even opponents go up against each other. I don't expect to see the same spread on the scoreboard as the 2013 Grey Cup. Obviously, <laughs> we remember how the, the Riders ran away with that one. Well, I remember the first half. You remember the first half? <laughs> that was, it was party time from half yeah. one. <laughs> uh, but you know what? Again, yeah, this is this is kind of a toss up. I I kind of uh, lean a little more towards uh, Hamilton. Uh, I feel like there's a little more uh, continuity with that team. They've been a, they've been together a little bit uh, longer. Uh, it seems, you know, kind of looking at the roster, they might have a little more uh, experience in different places uh, than the Riders do. Uh, so I'd probably, I'd probably go with Hamilton, but uh, yeah, it, it could come down to a, a last, a final two minute drill drive or a, or a walk off field goal. Uh, it's going to be a really close game if these two teams come up against each other, but I'm going to go with Hamilton. All right. And not only because I'm a homer will I go with the Riders, but if the Riders make it to the Grey Cup, It will be a home game. It will be 95% rider faithful probably in that building, as I'm sure most of the Stamps fans will sell their tickets to rider fans that will pay an arm and a leg and half a mortgage for. Um, We saw, I mean, it's a completely different team, but we saw how much home field advantage played into the hands of the riders in 2013. Um, I just... I just, there's something about this team that just tells me that they're winning this year. Unfortunately, they might be peaking a little early because if they win, I'm sure their roster will be dissected a little bit and they host next year. But I'm sure that fans won't feel too bad about that if they win the Grey Cup this year. Like you said, I think it'll be a close game. Um, And I just, there's something in my gut telling me that the Riders are winning the Grey Cup this year. And that's what I'm going with. They're a special team. Yeah, like they're... Uh, obviously I'm still living in uh, Regina and the excitement all year has just been uh, extremely high uh, they have a team that they can certainly be uh, certainly be proud of uh, yeah there is there really is just something something in the air in, in Saskatchewan this year yeah there you have it Addy taking Hamilton over Saskatchewan I'm taking Saskatchewan over Hamilton in the 107th Grey Cup in Calgary. Um, that should just about do it here as we ran through that pretty nicely. I think we got a lot of info to the listeners. Um, any final thoughts before we say goodbye? Uh, hopefully everybody stays warm, uh, whether they're huddled around uh, the TV or they're going out to uh, the games. But if you have the chance, go out to the games. Uh, if you're able to get some reasonably priced tickets uh this is you know one of the most exciting sports products there are out there uh there's always so many storylines heading into these games uh especially uh with these these western games every like you said every game is going to be a rivalry game so that just adds to uh adds to the fun of the entire thing uh but hopefully your uh hopefully your teams are successful and if they're not uh it seems like everybody that's a cfl fan has a a backup team so hopefully that one uh (laughs) be able to pull through for you regardless yeah well thank you as always for joining us Addy and providing your insight Uh, I had a blast doing this today yeah man it's always fun coming on and and chatting football with you and obviously uh, catching up with uh, all the things that you're up to out in uh, in Calgary with uh, with sports and I'm uh, always always proud that you're able to kind of chase something that you love and, and probably doesn't actually feel like work ever uh except for maybe today when you're out at practice uh freezing but <laughs> yeah covering stamps practice today in minus 13 temperatures is gonna be great <laughs> um all right well that will do it for our special episode of the cfl playoff preview i'm riley pollock i was joined by addison richards and as always follow us at squib kick radio on instagram Twitter and Facebook and uh, have fun watching CFL this weekend everybody